Good afternoon, and welcome to our general surgery lecture series. I am Dr. Rogelio E. Ribas, Corporate Vice President of Baptist Health International, and it is my pleasure to welcome you, our friends across Latin America and the Caribbean, to this informative presentation by a distinguished surgeon on staff at Baptist Health in Miami. During this interactive presentation, you will have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator for today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Dan Reese, a board certified surgeon who specializes in general and colorectal surgery. His presentation is titled, Rectal Cancer, Past, Present, and Future. Dr. Reese received his medical training at Santa Casa, Santa Casa de Misericordia in de Sao Paulo in Brazil and completed general surgery residency at New York Presbyterian Queens an affiliate of Wheel Cornell Medicine. His postdoctoral training includes clinical research fellowships in colorectal surgery at Sirio Libanes Hospital in Sao Paulo, St. Mark's Hospital in London, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and Cleveland Clinic in Florida. Dr. Reese is a highly skilled in all methods of colon and rectal surgery, including a wide range of robotic, minimally invasive, and advanced laparoscopic surgical procedures and proficient in a wide array of general surgery as well as upper digestive tract procedures. He is the chief of the colorectal division at Baptist Health, Baptist Hospital, and he also serves as an associate professor of surgery at Florida International University's Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine. In addition to being a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, Dr. Reese is a member of the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons and a and the Society of American Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons. He has authored numerous peer-reviewed research publications on surgical techniques and published more than 40 abstracts in medical journals and several book chapters. He also has been given, has given more than 60 oral and poster presentations at a national and international surgical conference. Please, let's give a warm, warm welcome to Dr. Dan Reese. Dr. Reese. Thank you, Rivas. Thank you for inviting me to be here. And uh, with uh, not, not uh, uh, many more words, we will start the presentation. Let me share my screen. You guys can see okay? We're okay, doctor. All right. So uh, I chose uh, rectal cancer for this presentation because there is uh, a lot of a lot of talk about uh, colorectal cancer being increasing nowadays. Uh, I'm going to talk about the past, the present, and the future. So how common is this cancer? Rectal cancer, here we are talking about the colon and the rectal cancer is the fourth most common cases uh, of cancer in the United States, being estimated 52,000 deaths per year uh, for just uh, colorectal. The rectal cancer represents uh, seven point eight percent of the new cancers in the United States. Uh, the numbers, if you see by age, this is a disease of elderly patients. So the older you are, more chance of having colorectal cancer. On the statistics, the mortality has been decreasing due to new modalities of treatment and the widespread of screening colonoscopy. So if you see the mortality at 2020, it's much lower than the early 40s, 60s. Uh, what worries all the, the, the colorectal GI society and all the, the doctors is this 20 to 49 year old, look at this, increase in rectal cancer. So those are rates per 100,000. So it's almost six per 
800,000. The orange marks just rectum and rectus sigmoid junction. The purple is proximal colon. The, the green is distal colon. So you see the rectal cancers are almost, you know, um, they have a statistic that by 2030, it's gonna be 124% increased. Uh, we'd say that is a disease from male sex because it's higher than females and Asian people get more rectal cancer than other races. Regarding genetics, we know that sporadic colorectal cancers are compromised by 60 to 65%. The remaining 35 to 40% has a, a genetic component. Family history without obvious genetic predisposition. And we have the 5% of the cancers being Lynch syndrome and uh, other genetic uh, mutated syndromes. The modifiable risks, physical inactivity and sedentary lifestyle. So physical activity is an important factor that may be reduced colorectal cancer risk, inhibition of fat accumulation, inflammation suppression, and improving gut motility and metabol metabolic hormones. The risk of colon cancer and rectal cancer in obese men at 50 years of age, it's 25% higher than normal weight. 10% for obese female. Modifiable, again, modifiable risks, alcohol, smoking, and vaping. The acetaldehyde is a human carcinogen and interacts with the intestinal mucosa, damaging the intestinal mucosa, as the smoking also does the same. Vaping, we don't have data to support that vaping causes increase of colorectal cancer. I put this slide here for everybody to, to know a curiosity. 4.5 of all adults use e-cigarettes in the whole country. One in 10 middle and high school students, so 10% uses used any type of tobacco in the United States. So if you have a kid in school, middle and high school, 10% of them tried e-cigarettes. It's just a curiosity. So past, so the rectal cancer, that's a little bit of history of the surgery. So the diagnosis of and description of rectal cancer symptoms, symptoms was done in England in 1376, the English surgeon John described bleeding, pain, and described this could be a, a, a rectal disease. The first surgeon in 1907 was called Dr. Miles, that is the Pope of the rectal surgery. He did the first abdominal perineal excision. So anyone that had rectal cancer from the bottom up, would undergo excision of the whole organ. The mortality was described at 50% after Miles Dixon described the low anterior resection, preserving the sphincters. However, the survival wasn't much better, 20 to 40%. So that's how we started surgery for rectal cancer. This is most of my talk will, will go through this uh, table here. That's the evolution of the rectal cancer treatment. It comes from how radiation chemotherapy improved survival and uh, local uh, recurrence, how TME, it's a total mesorectal excision, it's a surgical technique improve, uh, recurrence, and then they discuss different types of uh, chemotherapy. So I'm, I'll be talking about long-term, 
radiation therapy, short course radiation therapy, and how we do uh, the chemotherapy. So the first trial was called the Swedish trial. They compared just surgery that Dr. Miles have been doing and uh, just the surgical treatment of rectal cancer, adding radiation. They said, oh, maybe radiation is a good thing before surgery to avoid recurrence. So the Swedish tri trial was very important that lower the recurrence from 27 without radiation to 11%. So that was one of the milestones in rectal cancer treatment. Uh, usually nowadays, the, the National Cancer Institute guideline says, if you have a stage one, stage two, with no lymph nodes compromised, surgery is the standard of care. If you have local uh, lymph node that is positive, stage three, then you are adding chemo radiation to decrease um, recurrence rate. If it's a stage four with metastatic disease, we are adding other treatments to, to improve uh, longevity of these patients. So the Swedish trial here is the, the p-value that was very important on the local recurrence and the five-year survival benefit adding radiotherapy uh, plus surgery. The Dutch trial just um, repeated the same numbers. However, the two-year overall survival was not beneficial on this, but the local recurrent rate was decreased on the Dutch trial. So those are the two first trials that added the radiation therapy into the rectal cancer treatment. Um, the other trial that was um, discussed was uh, national trials, all those EORTC, FACC combined a long course chemo uh, chemo radiation therapy to the treatment before surgery. And also comparing those two groups, surgery alone versus um, and surgery uh, plus chemo radiation and radiation alone, the group that received chemo and radiation uh, had better uh, benefits. Here is another discussion we had. We used to do long-term radiation therapy for uh, all those patients. So it's a long course of radiation. And uh, Europe started doing a short course with the same amount of radiation, but it's just a tiny fraction of the, the period. And, and they realized the benefits were the same. So the patient had uh, less time of treatment and the same uh, benefits. So in, in, in the US, we usually use a long course radiation therapy, but it was, um, develop in Europe to kind of uh, improve uh, sometimes the long course, the patient, um, we, we lose some patients in the middle of the, the course. It's, it's like six weeks of uh, radiation therapy. So this uh, kind of changed the ways to do things, promoting the same results. There was the, the discussion between the short course and the long course radiation therapy. There was two or three papers that established that or short course or long-term long radiation will be giving you the same benefit without detriment of the short course. It will be easier for the, uh, for the patients to tolerate this. Uh, I'm a surgeon, so this was a landmark in, in, in rectal surgery. Dr. Hild described that the planes that we used to do, the, 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 the mesorectum, we used to use our hands and cut the mesorectum in the middle and leave some of the lymph nodes behind. He compared 
I think the first paper was uh, 80 to 100 patients. They compare the correct plan of dissection being the, the mesorectal fascia outside the fatty pad of the rectum, taking all the lymph nodes to a normal dissection that we were doing before in the 90s, 86. So he compares and his first paper, he had zero recurrence on the first two years. The second paper that came was a randomized trial that confirmed that the right surgery to do was a total mesorectal excision, respecting the plane of the mesorectal, taking all the lymph nodes, they will get a survival and less recurrence of the rectal cancer. Um, another big discussion was when to operate after chemo radiation. So we established that the guidelines and the right thing to do is to give chemo and radiation to a patient that has a lymph node positive. You want to sterilize the site to promote less recurrence and more survival. But when to operate? There was a big discussion if we're gonna operate right away or if we're gonna operate later on. We know radiation therapy keeps acting into the tissues all your life. This study showed that the optimal surgical time will be 10 to 12 weeks after surgery. The tissues were less inflamed, less complications, and better surgery operating eight weeks. And the tumor, if it was a big tumor, we could shrink the tumor, allowing us to save and spare a patient from, um, uh, uh, it was a, sph a sphincter preserving surgery. So the tumor that is very near the sphincter, giving that eight to or eight to 12 weeks uh, time after surgery would allow the radiation therapy to work and decrease the size of the tumor. So we could save some of the sphincters and allow them not to have a permanent colostomy. If uh, we have an invasion of the sphincter, the right surgery to do is the abdominal perineal resection that Dr. Miles used to do when he first described. <clears throat> so um, this is another um, paper showing 200 patients, just telling us again that six to eight weeks after neoadjuvant therapy was the best um, time interval for the TME surgery, total mesorectal excision and, and excision of the, the rectum. So we have, nowadays you use eight to 10 weeks. Here's the same. Going back here on this is the, so we spoke about the, the total mesorectal excision in 1986 that provided less recurrence. That was the surgical technique. We described that chemo radiation is the gold standard nowadays. And now we will discuss the Rapido and the project uh, papers that will discuss what kind of uh, chemo treatment and for how long we should uh, do. Um, so um, here on this uh, slide, we discuss total neoadjuvant therapy that uh, the patient gets a complete package of, usually it's full fox uh, chemotherapy before the surgery. And they do, often they do, uh, before the, the total neoadjuvant trial, they used to do two months of neoadjuvant therapy with chemo radiation, surgery, and then follow up with four months. Nowadays, we are doing everything in advance 
And those are the papers that show that there is a slight improve of um, metastasis-free uh, um, survival. So this is a, a complete response. Why I'm talking about the, the adjuvant therapy and the complete response, on the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about organ preservation. So there is some patients that get complete response and the tumor completely disappear just with radiation and chemotherapy. And there is a question, should we do uh, surgery on those patients? So we realize that uh, the complete response rate on those long-term chemo radiation was very high, 28% compare, compared just to the regular chemotherapy that we are doing before and after surgery. So this is uh, one of my Brazilian mentors, Angelita Gama, that in 2004 at the University of Sao Paulo, she realized that uh, people did uh, chemo radiation and uh, they will travel and they will come back after years for a follow-up and the tumor wasn't there. And she's like, oh, maybe this patient was just cured with chemo radiation. And she got a hundred and something patients and she follow up up to three years and she published the, 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 the first uh, paper on uh, watch and wait technique. You do the chemo radiation, if they have a complete response, we're gonna watch and wait. The next trial was an American trial. They said, oh, you know, in Brazil, they don't follow up patients. They, you know, they don't have the same uh, research. And I know how this works. We have much more money to do research in this country than, than in Brazil. I used to do research in Brazil. So they let's try to reproduce her numbers into the United States population. So the OPRA trial was the first trial that gave uh, full Fox and uh, the complete response they just followed without surgery. It was not easy for the colorectal surgeons, look at this and do not operate. Nowadays, this is very well established that if you have a complete response, you don't need to operate on those patients. You just follow up with three months sigmoidoscopy, six month MRI, depending on the protocol, and you don't need to operate because the patient has a complete response. Of course, the complete response it's usually happened on smaller tumors with small number of lymph nodes if they have a lymph node. So T1, T2, T3. But there is some T4s that uh, get better and, um, and completely resolve. So that's the OPRA trial that we did in the United States. Uh, actually, I was, I was searching the literature and um, last month, the OPRA trial just gave their last um, update because the question was, is the, the number of patients that went to complete response, how many of those they're gonna relapse? And if they relapse, they're gonna have metastasis. Should we have operated on them right after the chemo radiation? And this just confirmed that if they have a completely response and they have a recurrence, they do a total mesorectal excision as a salvage procedure. However, it's not detrimental to the survival and recurrence rate of this group. So if you wait, there is no, the delay in the surgery, there is no detriment of their survival. So that was 81 patients after uh, restaging and TME, 64%. And um, they also saw that most of the regrowth occurs in the first two years of uh, follow-up. So if you have a cancer that is gonna come back, 
the first two years needs to be a, a, a tire surveillance for those patients. One uh, other modality with, we learned with the long course chemotherapy and radiation, those tumors shrink and we had some 80 year old, 90 year old patients that we needed to treat that the, they didn't have a complete response. They had the tumor there, but are we gonna do a complete, you know, excision of the organ with a low anastomosis, with a high risk of leak? Um, those are the studies showing that a local excision can be done on those type of surgery, or those types of tumor. Usually T2, they're small, they don't penetrate the rectal wall that deep, and they have comparable uh, recurrence and uh, positive nodules. Uh, the guidelines nowadays for a T1, we can have up to 10% of a positive lymph node. And the transanal, excision of the tumor doesn't allow us to go after those lymph nodes that are sitting on the mesorectum. So if you have, on my practice, if I have a young patient with a T1 tumor, I'll explain to them there's 10% chance of having a lymph node compromise. And the other uh, type of treatment, you need to undergo a complete, you know, exenteration of the rectum but those are the choices that they, they can have. Some of the paper shows if they have a recurrence, it's a worse recurrence. You cannot salvage the patient because they're gonna have recurrence into the sacrum, but the numbers are, are, um, are okay if, you, if you're a little older and you don't wanna undergo a big complete resection of the rectum. This is a picture below of a robotic uh, four side stroker inside the rectum. And this is one of our patients we did. Uh, the patient was refusing any type of surgery, any type of removal of the rectum. He had a small superficial um, cancer that uh, it was a T1. And uh, I explained to him risks and benefits of the lymph nodes. Here is uh, uh, the site of the rectum already closed. And here is the, the robotic setup. The future of the robotic platform, we're going to have just one trocar inserted and one arm that turns into four little arms, and this is already FDA approved for prostate surgery, for um, ENT surgery. We got the robot delivery at Baptist a couple months ago, and they are already using it. For colorectal, the FDA is not approved yet. I think it's gonna take six months to approve a transanal uh, single port platform for, for our, our specialty, but it's coming. Um, what's new on the target therapy? We hear about immunotherapy, target therapy. So we had uh, chemotherapy was studied, radiation therapy, the technique of the surgery helping decrease uh, recurrence and survival. And now we have targeted therapy. The first targeted therapy was Avastin. Avastin was found to be good for patients who had BRAF mutations, so metastatic disease and BRAF mutations will slow the progression of the disease and improve disease-free, disease-free, no, the, the survival of those patients. You act on a pathway of the, the vessels and improve survival. The other type of biomarkers 
is the checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Keytruda was the first one. There's two other ones that they use uh, human programmed cell death PD-1 checkpoint. If you see on this little picture, you have the rectal tumor here and you have the Keytruda attaching this and uh, decreasing um, rectal cells life and killing the tumor. Um, this is used also for metastatic disease. The other one we have that we, we I think it was the last uh, couple of years ago on the ASCO meeting in 2022 that the Memorial Sloan Catherine Center showed uh, the use of um, tortaslimab, Jamperly, in 12 patients that completely, the tumor, rectal tumor completely disappeared. 100% have a complete clinical response. Uh, they had a follow-up, six to 25 months follow-up with no disease progression. They still working on this uh, study, doing randomized trials and more to come. So that's immunotherapy. Uh, another uh, idea is how we can measure circulating DNA of rectal cancer. We have a lot of studies in breast cancer delineating genetic lines of cancer, what immunotherapy to use. In rectal and colorectal cancer, we don't have it yet but we have the signatarium. You, if you go to, to oncology meetings, you're gonna start listening to, oh, should we order signataria? Should we order signataria? So, or should we do a liquid biopsy? So liquid biopsy is they, when we get the specimen, they measure, they, they, they take the DNA of the cancer and they have a way to do a, a CT DNA that we call. So it's a liquid biopsy. We, we draw blood and you know if there is circulating DNA of the rectal cancer that you had in your blood. So that's good for a patient who has surgery, completely responds, it's, it's free and the, the, um, the CEA is rising and we don't know if it's a true CA, we have negative CT scans, and we have a signatura showing that is negative. We know that the CA is probably not a correct one. So there is ways to 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 use the liquid biopsy. One good thing after surgery, if we do a good surgery, the the liquid biopsy should be negative. If uh, on stage uh, two cancers that we don't usually do chemotherapy before or after, if the signatory is positive, that group of patients that wouldn't benefit of chemotherapy, we know there is circulating DNAs, but that positive lymph nodes, it's not there yet. We benefit of uh, giving chemotherapy, and that's what is shown in this paper, increasing survival on those patients using the Signatera test. Uh, we can't forget that uh, rectal cancer and metastatic colorectal cancer is a multidisciplinary disease. The approach should be done and discussed at tumor board that improves quality of life, survival, and and patient satisfaction at the end of the day. We do a better do job discussing the cases with our colleagues. Usually it's an oncologist, radiation therapy, radiologist, gastroenterologist, and the colorectal surgeon discussing the case. This is our robotic team, one of the, the many members we have. The future. That's my little daughter. I don't know what she's going to do, but that's the future of our country. Uh, thank you very much for, for you guys listening.
Um, thank you, Rivas. Thank you, Dr. Reese. That was uh, amazing. Uh, an amazing journey from 1907 to now, right? Yes. Um, and, and you were taking me back through my medical school, medical school days. So um, it's uh, it's so important. I'm going to start with the last thing you talked about with the, the, the multidisciplinary approach. Um, the how how this benefited. I mean, we've seen a big difference for us at Baptist ever since the Miami Cancer Institute uh, opened up and had so many folks working together. Uh, can you can you talk about a little bit about how through your journey, how you've seen this approach change things for you? Yeah, so we realize um, in the beginning of my career, the patient will come to me and I'll decide, uh, oh, let's do surgery or let's do chemo radiation. And I'll send the patient to the radiation oncologist. But remember, we are very specialized doctors. The oncologist sometimes just see chemotherapy in front of them. I sometimes just see surgery in front of me. The radiation oncologist sees protons and, and sometimes we see a patient. And for me, it's a simple procedure say, guys, why are you gonna submit this patient to chemo radiation? I can just take it out. And that's what, you know, there's papers and papers. I was looking into papers. I couldn't put more slides in, into my presentation, but there is paper showing that if you have a rectal cancer, it should be a multidisciplinary approach, improve survival of the number of patients that they did. So, uh, it's a healthy conversation and the only benefit will be the, the pa patient treatment, you know? And uh, some of the cases that I discuss, I see everybody my, like a family member. So they, they the radiation oncologist and, and the oncologist, oh, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. Did you ever talk to the patient about doing nothing? Is the patient happy, 90 years old with cancer? you know, being left alone. And they said, yeah, maybe I should ask the patient, you know? So I think there is, there, there's need to be a, a, and nowadays I think every specialty, breast, neuro, urology, we have a tumor board in every discipline. They, they realize it just benefits the patient, yeah. And in the past, we used to see it, react, biopsy it, react, surgery. Yeah. And and can you talk a little bit about, you know, you're so involved with, with so many of these studies and, and things moving forward that we don't realize how we can we can hurt somebody's other chances or choices or treatment choices in the future if we start doing things without not looking at it, like you said, the genetic, the aspect of, of not just the patient, but also of the tumor. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because a lot of us here uh our, our our general docs also and so obviously you're worried right you're worried about misdiagnosing uh about not doing a rectal uh, rectal exam and, and maybe you can expand on that also on the part of how the, how the pcp can actually help you get the patient sooner because you and i many times have to deal with a case that's so advanced right by the time it gets to us if you can go over that a little bit and 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 tell us, you know, about, you know, what we can do better as primary care doctors, uh, as you as a colorectal surgeon, to help you. So the 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 medical population realized that the rectal cancer and colorectal cancer was increasing because we. I don't know if it's post-COVID that people didn't get their screening colonoscopies, but I'll talk to any of my colleagues like, wow, there's so many cancers. I don't know if they, they didn't get treated, but we were wor working full time. I didn't have uh, to stop. The screening colonoscopy stopped for, for six months. So there was a delay on the screening colonoscopy. Uh, but the government also realized and changed after, after research Populational research, they changed the guidelines for a screening colonoscopy from 50 years old to 45. 
So everybody who is 45 should have their screening colonoscopy. In my practice or uh, any GI practice, because I asked them, what do you do with a 36 year old that comes with rectal bleeding? I think out of 10 GIs that I asked, nobody's gonna skip a colonoscopy on a 30, 30 year old that is bleeding. But then I can't, there is 20 year old with rectal cancer. If I skip, I'm, I'm doing harm. So before we used to say, no, it's probably your hemorrhoids. You had kids, you were constipated. Nowadays, rectal bleeding means a colonoscopy, you know? There's other ways to, to screen for, for colorectal cancer. You know, it's uh, the, the fecal cold blood test, the, um, the Cologuard that is very uh, well known. Uh, they work if you do every year. They're not gold standard in our society, but uh, if you do every year, uh, I think there is a, a use for it. The colonoscopy is still the gold standard for colorectal cancer. And recently, I think there was a change. If you had a colonoscopy and you had a rectal bleed due to, you know, whether it was possibly hemorrhoids or something else, and but you didn't have any polyps, uh, they used to say, come back in five years, right? But now I think they're, they're, they're come back in 10 years because you, the, the guidance had changed on that. Uh, what what do you see that as as affecting your 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 side? No, the guidelines uh, for no family history uh, still ten years. What it what it changed was some of the polyp. We used to have one little polyp come back in five years. Now you have one, two, three, up to four polyps. More, more than four polyps, you come back in seven years, adenomas, depending on the type of the polyps. So I think they space it out a little bit, uh, the adenoma surveillance, because they know the adenoma is going to take 10 to 15 years to transform into a, into a cancer. And uh, the intervals are still 10 years for someone. Um, I don't know if you know, I don't I don't have the research in front of me, but maybe 10 years, it's a lot to wait, but those are the guidelines and they did populational studies. So I believe on the 10 years, but if you have symptoms in between your five-year colonoscopy and your 10 year, you should go back to the doctor because we can miss one in 3000 polyps. We can miss polyps, you know? We have a question from, uh... Uh, Manuel Marchena Guillen, thank you for your question. So does Dostar, Dostarlimab, and every day they make the names even harder, can be used as a complement of principal treatment in order to prevent a relapse? So it seems pretty sure because yeah. of the numbers. So uh, my lecture was almost an oncology, oncology lecture because all the future is on immunotherapy. If you tell me to repeat the name, I'm probably going to get it wrong. But uh, all those uh, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, they're being used for almost metastatic disease that they are trying to shrink the amount of tumor burden. And the insurance are not approving for uh, avoiding relapse. You know, you cure your disease and you give immunotherapy for them. Um, there's some specific mutation points uh, that you need to have also for those uh, drugs to work. So uh, we are not there yet because the, the amount of genetic testing, I think it needs to be a little bit more refined for us to say, this is gonna work to keep your cancer down. But I think it's coming, yeah. And so a patient that's coming to see you, and is possibly going to need surgery. Uh, the next question is, and might need long-term therapy. You know, how long should they think about being here? If they're going to come get operated with you and post-operative. Uh, I know that Baptist is one of the few facilities that actually we, we share sometimes our protocol so that the patient can go home 
and continue therapy and monitor together with the oncologist back home. I know a lot of institutions that do not do that at all and refuse to do it. Um, that's not our that's not our way. Uh, but um, for long term chemo and stuff, uh, how long should the surgical patient think to stay here? Uh, and then I guess the more complicated with RADS or chemo, right? The longer the stay, right? Yeah, the depending on the on the on the tumor, they they we discussed with the radiation therapy if they're gonna do a short term uh, therapy. And um, some of the centers outside, they have good, very good radiation uh, therapy center and chemotherapy. So we just share the tumor board decision and we give them, um, um, I saw some of the oncologists, they send emails or letters. This is my recommendation. They go back there. We just need to plan the date. If we're gonna operate eight to 10 weeks, uh, they should be planning for a rectal cancer surgery uh, three to four days in the hospital, depending how complicated it is, and uh, th three weeks uh, to recover from that. Regarding the chemotherapy, most most of the, the patients want, want to go home, only if they have a second home in Miami, and then they will stay, you know? But they they we, they share the protocol and they they go home and uh, and uh, we have uh, the the problem we are having is with the immunotherapy that not every hospital still have and not every insurance pays for it. So you know, and very costly. Yes, yes, that's the problem. Yeah. So. Uh, next question is from uh, Frederick Goldsmith. Uh, could you advise on surveillance for colonoscopy for tubular villus adenomas, C cell serrated polyps, and villus adenomas and the tubular adenomas? Yeah, so the tubular adenomas are the most common one. That's what we have. If you have one, two, three polyps, seven years, those are the guidelines. If you don't have family history, if you have family history, it goes down to three to five years. More than four tubular adenomas goes back to five years. The other tubular villus adenoma, the bigger they are, bigger they are, more cancer they can harbor. So the tubular villus adenoma, they're gonna, gonna go back to, to three years. It's, it should be a shorter interval. It depends on the number of polyps, size of the polyps. If you have a three, four centimeter polyp, we know that you need to do a, a colonoscopy earlier. But the, the, the other thing we need to, to see is those flat lesions. Usually the flat lesions are the dangerous ones because we can't barely see. And, and those that we need to do EMR, injection, raise, those are three, four, five centimeter lesions that we need to repeat colonoscopy sometimes every six months to see if they have a recurrence. But there's guidelines. The, the place to look for it, uh, it's a 2020 task force. So if you look for the tax fo task force from the American College of Gastroenterology, 2020 task force, they're gonna have tables and uh, and all the, the information. And if a patient would be uh, referred to you, what would be the optimal things that we would need here for you to be able to, to help a patient? With the diagnosis of cancer or? Yeah, with a possible, let's do both, right? Let's do with a possible mass and then we'll do with one that's already been diagnosed. So if the patient is diagnosed, we need to know the stage of the cancer. So a colon cancer, the staging is CT scan of chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and the CEA. If you have a rectal cancer, we need to stage the pelvis. We need to study the mesorectal. So we need to know if there's lymph nodes involved. The test we order for staging the rectal cancer is a MRI. 
and it's an MRI with IV and without contrast, and we have a rectal cancer protocol that we use here. If you have an MRI machine in your hospital, we just need to make sure that they are using a rectal protocol. It's different slice that we can uh, really see those lymph nodes because this is gonna influence the treatment. No lymph nodes go straight to surgery. Positive lymph nodes, we need to sterilize the pelvis with chemo radiation before the surgery to decrease uh, decrease uh, recurrence, improve survival. And that's what six to eight weeks after is would be the surgery if uh, chemo and rads. Eight, eight to ten. If eight you to do ten. The, the regular pro. If you lose use a short term protocol, you can do it earlier. Then it's now, a discussion on the tumor board. And common complications of of this. Um, <laughs> of the colorectal surgery, uh, the colostomies and stuff. Uh, can you go over that a little bit? We don't have any complications here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, How did I know? I know. No, the complications, so the colostomy, so the complications, the, the, the fierce complication is a anastomotic leak. If you have a, a, a anastomosis in the high rectum, that means you have a lot of space to redo your anastomosis, to reoperate. But if you have a, a anastomosis that is right on the anal, uh, the dentate line, you don't have a margin for error. So then the robotic surgery helps immensely on a, on a male pelvis that is very narrow and deep. Without the robotic surgery, uh, I don't think we can do a proper TME uh, surgery. It's like the prostate uh, surgery. They do a better better job doing robotic prostate surgery. We do a better job doing, there are studies proven that there is a uh, better surgery done. We need a protective ileostomy to protect that connection. So the patient is gonna have an ileostomy for 10 to 12 weeks. Sometimes we close a little earlier to protect you, avoid a pelvic sepsis. If you have a leak, your anastomosis is still salvageable, you know? That's when we do a protective ileostomy. Uh, uh, end colostomy with permanent colostomy, we do, if we do radiation, do chemotherapy, and the sphincter still being invaded by tumor. There is no way to cure that patient if you don't take out the, the sphincter. Um, which other complications? Um, I think there is a lot of studies showing that if the patient walks, take care of themselves, an elderly, that exercise, there is a uh, improve us, uh, um, decrease complications on uh, physical therapy before uh, surgery. So if you know the patient is gonna have surgery and it's an uh, elderly, tell them to go into a exercise proto uh, protocol that we have a division in Baptist that does uh, preoperative exercise lifting weights and walking around, exercise your lungs, decreases complication. That's one of the things we do. Something we know they're gonna go for chemo radiation and I'm gonna be operating three months later, I send them for for the gym at Baptist. So we uh, we do a lot of work together, you and I, with the team, right? We get a lot of complicated cases internationally. We Internationally, we do about 14,000 international patient visits a year. 40% of them are cancer related. Um, so, and, and, and many of those complications we get because of sometimes uh, going a little bit more than, than maybe the training has led, right? Um, so I, I would say the question I have for you is, you know, what would be the don't do recommendation before we leave today uh, that you would recommend to this to this video video conference that 
that could actually lead to a lot of the complications you you and I have to deal with uh, later on. Uh, what is the most frequent thing that you would say don't do? I don't know if there is any specific. Uh, uh, that, uh, in general, for rectal cancer, don't decide by yourself. Even if I know the answer, I have made mistakes before. That's like, oh, you didn't see this? No, I didn't see this. So ask your colleague, get a, if, if, if you have a tumor board in your hospital, rectal cancer, the standard of care, it's a multidisciplinary approach. So always ask, ask for help, you know? Well, doctor, thank you so much. Um, uh, there, if you have any other further questions, uh, it can be uh, relayed to us later on. Uh, but uh, this has been very informative. And, and if at any time anybody would like to reach out uh, to uh, Dr. Reese, please let us know. And we will be more than happy to uh, 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 ex uh, expedite or answer any of these questions. But doctor, on behalf of Baptist Health International, I would like to thank you for the informative presentation and all of today's participants for your attendance. If you have any further questions about today's presentation, please feel free to email them to us at bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. That is bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. We promise to get your questions over to Dr. Reese, and knowing Dr. Reese, he will be more than happy to help get those questions answered. We look forward to seeing you at our next general surgery lecture series scheduled for Wednesday, June 19th, 2024. Thank you again. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Reese. Thank you.